Thank you. Yeah, so this is the third in the, se the so-called origin series, right? The, 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 the fourth and last one, the final one will be on, I believe, on the 20th of December. Okay, and that is on the political image. Okay, so today we are going to talk about a very salacious topic, okay, the nude. Um, well, I suppose, uh, you know, in this day of age, this day and age, you know, I mean, we are, I, I suppose it's no longer a kind of a taboo subject, right, with our exposure to social media, internet, etc. Okay. Um, you know, we have sometimes, you know, what, what they say, we have become sort of desensitized, you know, right, okay, to, to uh, images of nudity and nakedness, right. But however, you know, um, you know in certain countries, you know, um, you know nudity and, and the nude, Okay, it's still very much a kind of a very sensitive subject, all right? And uh, you know, and, and you know, artists are still being subjected to uh, censorship. Okay, I think we'll briefly discuss that towards the end of the talk. Okay, maybe before we start, right? Um, I suppose all of you, you know, have some understanding of what the word or the term the nude means, correct? Okay. Everyone has a, an idea. Well, you can put it simply, it's, you know, a state of undress, you know, without clothes or clothing, right? Um, in fact, uh, we encounter the nude every day. You might be surprised to hear that, okay? And that is ourself, okay? When, for example, we change our clothes, right? We go to the bathroom or the toilet, okay? And uh, however, you know, um, although the term the nude can um, imply or, you know, can be um, defined as a state of undress is more than that, all right? right? It's, it's, I suppose the nude, all right, you have to use the word the nude with the word the in it, okay? It's actually a specific category in art, all right? And, um, you, know, it, you know, this term reflects, you know, very complex uh, philosophical concept, okay? And has to do with ideas of the body and even ideas of the spirit and the soul. Right, because, for example, the ancient Greeks see a link between, you know, the body and the soul. And, you know, it, you know, it, and it is also linked with concepts relating to, you know, religion and to aesthetics. Okay, so this term, the new, is a very specific, um, you know, term, right? Very specific uh, category in Western art. Okay, in fact, it's, uh, you know, in Western art, it's uh, what you call a genre. Right, it's a genre in Western art. Okay, and we'll talk more about that, right, in a while. Now, anyone knows, you know, maybe you can tell me what's the difference between nude and naked. Okay, does anyone want to offer your, your view, your opinion? What's the difference between, you know, the, the word nude and naked. Mm, very quiet audience today. <laughs> oh yes, we have a volunteer. <laughs> Someone who yes please. Okay, so one is a show. You mean? Ah, okay. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. A anyone else? Okay. It's not a, a, a very easy answer, I suppose. You know, there's no like a straightforward answer. We think we know what it is, but you know, it's difficult to put in words sometimes. Right. Oh yes, Mr. Choi. Sure, you would like to hear that. Yeah, I think I think we all know that to artists. To the artists, when we say new, we always think of it as a work of art. So it's something very positive. Mm. Yeah. Naked, I suppose, is something else, like like lacking something or what. Right. Or what, I don't know. But to the art, the point I want to make is to the artists, when we use the word new. We are talking about work, work, 
works of art, you know, and it's almost understood. Precisely. Precisely. Yes. Yes. Certainly. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I think I think I, I will leave the the you know um, the definition to someone who's an expert, right, uh, on the nude. And of course, that's the you know the famous art historian Kenneth Clark, right, who um, you know you know sort of uh, make, makes this difference in his book, right, called the nude. Okay. And you know, and he says, as as correctly pointed out by uh, Mr. Choi, I mean, to be naked is to be deprived of our clothes. So once we are deprived of our clothes, we feel ashamed, we feel vulnerable, right? Okay, whereas the word, the nude, in fact, conjures, you know, a different sort of uh, uh, meaning, right? Okay, it, it does not conjure up a defenseless body, but of a balanced, prosperous, and confident body, the body reformed. Okay, so that, those are the two differences. I, I suppose one is... Uh, you know, um, um, thought of in a more positive sense, right? The other in a more negative sense. Okay, I'm, one example, for example, is Adam and Eve, right? From the Bible. Okay, what happened when they discovered that they were naked, right? They immediately tried to cover themselves. Okay? So I suppose we can look at it in that, in that way. Right? So I suppose when, as we go along, you know, you will probably see we have some... Uh, I suppose images that are nude, others you can call it naked, right? But again, as I said, you know, these categories are sometimes not so easy to define. And as you know, Western art is preoccupied with the naked body or with the nude, okay, I, I would say, right? With the nude. Okay, and the nude, in fact, has little importance in Asian art. You know, what, what's the reason for this, you know? Why? Okay, why, why, you know, I mean... Okay, anyone, you know, sort of, <laughs> would like to offer your suggestion? Except for India, in fact. Right, except for India. Um, I don't know, maybe you, maybe you can tell me why, you know, why? Maybe one sort of reason I can propose is that in, uh, you know, unlike the West, right, in Asia, there's very little emphasis on the individual, individuality, right? And, but there's a lot of more emph emphasis, for example, on community living, right? And of course, religion plays a part as well, right? I'm not saying that, you know, in the West, you know, religion did not, did not have a, a big influence, right? But in Asia, you know, um, art became almost synonymous with religion, right? Okay, so perhaps these are some couple of uh, suggestions why the nude didn't really take off in Asia, except for India, all right? And we shall tell you why in a while. And mastering the, the nude, right, the naked human body, right, was always seen right, in Western art as a true test of you know, an artist's skills and abilities. Right? And the nude, in fact, provided uh, opportunities for, for an extraordinary range of, uh, of, of you know, um, innovation, artistic innovation, right? and a range of, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, representation, etc. Now, do we know, you know, um, when did the nude originate, right? What's the, what, you know, what evidence do we have of the earliest nude image? You have it in your hands already, so, you know. Um, yeah, perhaps, you know, the nude image can be traced back to prehistoric times. Okay, back to what you call the Paleolithic period. Okay, the, the old Stone Age. Right. Now, what you see here right, might be one of the earliest images of the nude. Okay. Now, it's a small but yet monumental figure. It's only about four inches. Right. It's made of uh, limestone. Right. You can see that it's not very pretty. Right. It doesn't conform to your usual notions of beauty. Okay. But I suppose that's not the artist's intention. Right. You can see that it's almost grotesque deformed, right, distorted, 
Okay, but I suppose you know there is a certain reason for this. Right? Now do you notice that certain parts of the body are exaggerated? Right? The breast, the pelvic area, okay, the thighs. Okay? And you know what those areas have to do with? They have to do with precisely fertility, right? Childbirth. Right? So these figures have been identified as what you call fertility figures. Right? Or some will call them fertility goddesses. Okay, and you know, quite a number of these figures have been found. Right? And you know, historians and archaeologists have uh, you know given these figures the name of Venus. Okay, because Venus, as you know, is the Greek goddess of love, beauty, and you know, some even say procreation, okay, fertility. Um, you can see that, you know, I mean, um, and you know, the, the, whoever did this, right, whichever artist who did this, you know, were not concerned so much with anatomical details. Right, you can see that it's almost faceless, right? We don't know what is that. Is that a, a, a kind of a, a headgear or hat you know, that the figure is wearing? Or is that a mass of hair that you see there covering the face? Okay, we are not very clear about that. Okay, but clearly the artist okay, was not concerned with anatomical details here or anatomical accuracy. Hmm, in India, Okay, we already have uh, the nude appearing in quite, you know, early times, right? Dating back to what you call the Indus Valley Civilization, which is the earliest civilization in India. Okay, and the Indus Valley is located in what is today's Pakistan. And uh, this is the famous uh, sculpture, okay, that was, uh, you know, found in the, in, you know, in, in uh, I believe in Mohanjo-Daro. Okay, one of the sites of the Indus Valley Civilization. Right? And it's a bronze statuette okay, of um, a young woman. Okay? And this sculpture has been termed a dancer. Okay? But the thing is that you know, we don't know whether you know, um, she's actually dancing. Right? But however, if you look at her pose, her pose may suggest you know, that um, you know, she, she's dancing or beating to something, you know, music or rhythm. But this image has captured the imagination of many people, right? Which includes some of the most famous archaeologists like Mortimer Wheeler, right? I mean, when you talk about Indian archaeology, right? You know, he's the, he's the most famous archaeologist, right? Mortimer Wheeler. And, you know, Mortimer Wheeler says that, you know, there's, if you can read the quote, okay? That little Baluchi style face. I mean, Baluchi refers to people um, who live in, um, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, right? Those region. Okay? And, you know, I think what, is, what has endeared this um, sculpture to, to many people, I think, really, it are two things, her expression and a pose. Right? If you look at her expression, you know, you know, she looks rather, you know, um, uh, arrogant, right? There's a hint of arrogance there. Okay? Um, and if you look at her pose, Right. Okay. There's a kind of a hint of impudence. Okay. A hint of, uh, I suppose, the confidence as well. Right. So she's someone who is very sure of herself. Right. A confident young woman. Okay. And I think you know. I think that what makes this image, you know, a very timeless one. Right. Something that you know we can relate to. Okay, and what is also striking, if you can see that she's uh, she's almost like you know naked except for the bangles that she wears, right, on the left hand. All right, and this is a very rare bronze image, right, bronze sculpture, because um, you know very few bronze sculptures were discovered, right, in this particular civilization, right, the Indus Valley civilization. And if you look at the 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 kind of the the pubic area, you can see that it's uh, delineated by a downward pointing triangle. Okay, so the downward pointing triangle is to become, you know, symbolically uh, a symbol of uh, femininity, right? A symbol of, 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 of the feminine, femininity, okay? 
And in Egypt, right, this is one of the rare, I suppose, uh, 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 painting, right, which depict the nude. Okay, now, I mean, before the Greeks, um, you know, they're, they're, I mean, the nude did not sort of um, occur widely in, you know, any of the pre-Greek civilization, right? I suppose this is uh, one of the, the few images that we find in Egypt, right? It depicts, um, you know, you can see there, some musicians and dancers, right? And you could see that, you know, um, the, the, the dancers are, are naked, okay, or, you know, except for, you know, some jewelry that they wear, the wigs and cosmetics, right? And typical of uh, Egyptian um, style of depicting the human figure, you'll see that, right, the dancers are depicted with their eyes in front, as well as their, you know, their upper body in front as well, right? While their legs and, and um, you know, and their head are shown in profile. Now, another question for you. Are all nudes erotic? Are all nudes erotic? This is a very simple question to answer. <laughs> the evidence was in the earlier slides that I show you. Right. Do you consider all nudes to be erotic? No, right? I can see some people nodding their head. Okay, obviously not. You know, not all nudes are erotic. I mean, do you consider the Venus of Willendorf, right, to be erotic? Right, I doubt so. Okay. And I mean, there are artists who has depicted a nude, right, but uh, in a very non-erotic way. I remember that you know Rembrandt, for example, had a, a painting of Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the you know. Um, um, King David's uh, uh, mistress and later his wife. Okay, and he depicted Bathsheba. You know, although she's uh, in the nude, right? Okay, you can see that you know there's nothing erotic about her, right? In fact, that's what you call a kind of an emotional, right, or psychological nude, right? Rather than a kind of erotic nude. Okay, so not all not all nudes, I suppose, are erotic. But maybe you know you want to kind of reach some conclusion you know as the lecture goes on, right? Whether all nudes are erotic or not. How about this? Do you consider this to be erotic? Okay. Now be before we answer the question, I mean this is a very famous work, okay, by William Bouguereau, the birth of Venus. I mean the birth of Venus is really one of the most famous subjects, right, in the history of painting. Okay, and um, here, you know, uh, you know, I mean, legend tells mm. us, you know, that uh, Venus was uh, formed fully grown from the sea. In fact, from the castrated genitals of Uranus. Right, she was formed from the sea, and then she was transported on a shell. Okay, to mm. the island of Cyprus. Okay, that was what we are told. Okay, and um, so here you see Venus, um, you know, being transported um, on a shell, okay, on a dolphin chariot, right? She's being pulled by the dolphin, and the dolphin is actually one of her attributes, right? The attributes of Venus, right, the goddess. And, um, you know, as she lands on the shores of, uh, you know, Cyprus, you see her being surrounded Okay, by um, some figures, you'll see the putti there, P-U-T-T-I. Now the putti are what you call the, um, this cute, chubby, you know, sort of a male, um, I don't know, angel-like uh, creatures that you see there, okay, of which uh, Cupid is one of them, right? So Cupid is actually a putti, right? Okay, so she's surrounded by that. And she's also surrounded by um, her entourage, right? You, you'll see the names there, the sea names as well as the centaurs, right? Centaurs blowing, you know, trumpeting her arrival. Okay, so it's a kind of a celebratory sort of uh, image here. All right, but I want you to focus on the figure of Venus, right? What is she doing there? Right? I mean, the way she stands, okay, uh, you know, is in a very, what you call a classical pose. Okay, so this artist is, was undoubtedly influenced by classical art, right? She stands in a very, what you call a contrapposto pose, right? Which uh, accentuates the sensuality of the figure. Okay, and you also notice that um, you know um, she's actually 
you know what she's doing there is not so much arranging her hair but wringing, wringing her hair okay that's also one of the, the more common motifs in the in the images of venus you always see her wringing her hair okay right but i suppose here the artist used that as an excuse right to show the more erotic side of the nude okay so as she's um sort of arranging her hair okay you'll see that you know it leaves a breast fully exposed right okay fully exposed and um, you know that i think and coupled with the kind of alabaster skin you know the smooth skin of the figure you know really enhances the kind of the erotic quality of this work right? so sometimes artists you know they, they use goddesses you know to disguise you know um, this this uh, they desire to show the erotic in art okay uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that right later Okay, I suppose what uh, Bogoro did, okay, the painting that he did, okay, was the, the nude you can consider to be what he called the idealized nude. Okay, and the idealized nude really originated in Greek art. Okay, in fact, the, the nude emerged as a genre in Greek art okay, before the 5th century BC, okay, or BCE, the, before the Common Era. Now, this word, idealized, Okay, it suggests something which is without flaw. Okay, right. In the case of, for example, Greek sculptures, right, you will, you will not find, for example, any physical flaws. Right, the, the, the features are almost perfect. Right, okay, there are no blemishes, right, no pimples, etc. Right? It's almost perfect. Okay, and it's also ideally proportioned. Okay, so that's what the word idealized suggests. Okay, and this idealized nude was to be a preoccupation of Western art till the 19th century, right? When realism, for example, began to take over. Okay, we'll, we'll again we'll talk about that in a while. Wow, look at this very powerful and dynamic image. Okay, and uh, now I have to say that you know many of the Greek many, I think a major the majority of Greek sculptures. Okay, were done in the medium of bronze, right? And but unfortunately, this is one of the few examples of the original Greek sculptures that we have today, right? And the rest were possibly melted away, okay, to be you know reused for other purposes, okay. So the majority of uh, Greek sculptures that we have today are actually Roman copies, okay. So what you see here is actually a Greek bronze original. Right. And let me tell you, it's very different, okay, the medium of bronze versus the me medium of marble. Okay, many of the copies were actually done in marble. Okay, because there's so much uh, possibility that you can do in terms of the, the pose of the figure, okay, when you do it in bronze. Okay, that, you know, marble, because it doesn't have the kind of tensile strength, okay, that bronze actually has. Okay. Now, this figure, you know, you can see a man of action, you know, right, okay, with uh, his... One of his hands stretched out, right, and the other one bent as if carrying something. Okay, and um, you know, it's thought that this figure, okay, represents one of the Greek gods. Okay, some say that it represents Zeus. Okay, Zeus is the chief of the gods. He's also the gods of the uh, god of the sky and thunderstorms. Okay, so as a result, you know, uh, some thought that the right hand would originally have carried a thunderbolt. Okay, which is an attribute of Zeus. Okay. But if it's Poseidon, okay, the god of the sea, then the figure will have carried a trident. Okay, because the trident is an attribute of Neptune or Poseidon. Okay. Now, Zeus is normally depicted as bearded in art. Okay, and he's always given a kind of god-like okay, um, ideal proportion. Okay, so likewise in this image, you can see that it's very muscular, okay, uh, ideally proportioned. Right? Very powerful, muscular, right? dynamic, ready for battle. Okay. And you know, it, later on I'll mention that you know, in, the, in, in Greece, and as you know, on the Olympics, right? the Greece is the birthplace of the Olympics. But you know that the, you know, the, the first Olympians participate in the Olympics in the nude. Okay? They didn't have any clothes on. 
Okay. And not only that, right? Um, victors in the Olympic Games were highly honoured. Okay. Some of them were honoured with sculptures, statues of themselves. And these statues were placed in temples, in sanctuaries. Right. So the male nude, okay, at least in, in, in the Greek world, has always come to symbolise triumph, glory, right, and moral excellence. How about the female nude? Well, I suppose you know you can consider the Venus of Willendorf to be a female nude, right? Okay, but I suppose again it's the Greeks that made the female nude, okay, uh, you know, as a kind of a, a genre, right, in Western art. Okay, and in fact, the female nude started to appear in Greek art in about the fourth century BCE, right, the fourth century BCE. Um, when Praxiteles, who was a famous sculptor, right, made his uh, sculpture of Venus, okay, the Canadian Venus, right, I mean, uh, showing Venus about to take a ritual bath, okay, that was uh, supposedly the, the first female nude to appear in Greek art. And unlike the male nude, right, the female nude, right, in fact, represents vitality of life, okay, of the life principle, procreation, fecundity, maternal energy. Okay, so you'll see the female nude, you know, almost invariably being depicted as very soft, delicate, okay, and, you know, provocative, okay, because of uh, these qualities. But I'm not going to show you that uh, sculpture, that famous sculpture by Praxitis. I think I've showed it in a previous uh, lecture here. I'm going to show you perhaps what you call the Mona Lisa of sculpture. Right. Anyone knows what the Mona Lisa of sculpture is? The Venus di Milo. Okay. I mean, some of you have, okay, I'm sure you have. How many of you have seen it in the Louvre? Or the Louvre? Oh, sure. Right. Okay. Maybe can someone tell me what's your impression when you first saw it? Okay, anyone who went there, you know what's, you know, in a few words, you know what's your kind of, maybe the gentleman here, yeah? you went to the, the Louvre. Right? I mean, what do you think when you saw the Venus, Venus di Milo? Oh, majestic. Do you say yeah, the word majestic? All right. Good. Any other sort of uh, term to describe this? <laughs> right. Mm. I suppose this is over life size. All right. So it's, it's over life size. Okay. Um, you know, even with his arms missing, right? Okay. It's still, as, as you put it, majestic. Right. It's still very graceful. It still retains this kind of classical beauty. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, the background to this is that, um, you know, when they discovered this sculpture, I believe it was, hmm, I can't remember the date, the 19th century, okay, it, 1814 or somewhere there, right, they discovered, uh, you know, the, the, that, you know, the, they discovered the sculpture in pieces, right, okay, the arms were separated from the torso and then, you know, the, the legs were separated, okay, but what happened to the arms? They actually discovered the arms. Okay, but unfortunately, the arms while being transported at sea were lost at sea. Okay, so that's unfortunate. So it's still missing in sea somewhere. So maybe, hopefully one day, right, the arms will be discovered. Okay. And, you know, one of the arms was holding, you know, how do we know that it's a Venus? Okay, through her attributes. Okay, one of her attributes is the golden apple. Okay, I mean, it's, it's too long to relate the story of the golden apple. Okay, I mean, it's related to the story of, you know, Aphrodite, you know, sort of uh, wanting to see who's the most beautiful goddess of them all, right? Okay, so um, Paris, you know, Paris, uh, you know, um, of, of Troy awarded her the golden apple, right? Okay, because she promised him that she can get him the most beautiful woman in the world. Okay, but that's another story. So, you know, the golden apple, okay, is all, has always been one of the attributes of Venus, or what you call, the Greeks call her Aphrodite, right? In, the Romans would call her Venus. Okay. And her, her right hand would carry that. And her left hand, you know, it was said that, you know, it was um, it goes across a torso and holds part of a sash. Okay. So that's how originally it would have it would have appeared. Right. In India. Okay, I mean I've I've shown you the um, the image of the, the dancing girl from Mohanjo Daro. 
Okay, but one of the most popular images of the nude okay, in India are what you call this yakshis. Okay, on your left, okay, the yakshi. Okay, and of course she has a female, uh, her male counterpart called the yaksha. Okay, but you know the yakshi, as you can see here, is a, a fertility or earth spirit. Okay, it's said that the yakshi can give life to a tree by touching it with a foot. Right? And this particular yakshi that you see here is found in one of the gateways in Sanchi, right? the great stupa in Sanchi. Right? And it serves as a kind of a bracket. Right? She, you can see here she holds a mango tree, okay? probably giving life right? to the mango tree. And also, what I want you to notice also is the pose. Okay, so she's depicted in what you call a, a tribanga, right? Tribanga pose, T-R-I-B-A-N-G-A. -A. Okay, or what you call a tree band pose. Okay, and the, the bands occur at the neck, right? The torso and the legs. Okay, so that imparts a, a, you know, a kind of a sensuality, even eroticism, right? To the figure, right? But you can see that, you know, in itself, right? The figure is quite voluptuous. Okay, um, but and you know you can see that the Yakshi figure has influenced uh, other sculptures, right? Later on in Indian history, okay. For example, the sculptures in Kajuraho that you see on the right, okay. That were uh, you know Kajuraho. I don't know. I, well, anyone been to Kajuraho? Okay. It seems that you know tourists flock there to see its temples, okay, because its temples contain uh, what you call this, uh, you know, pornographic. Sculptures, yes, on temple walls. Okay, right. Okay, but I'm showing you a tamer version, right? Okay, just a nude. <laughs> and um, so you can see the the one on the right. Okay, um, you know, again, in, in terms, you can see that she also has a tribanga pose. All right, and equally as voluptuous. Okay, but in India, okay, religion and sex are not necessarily seen in conflict. Okay. Right? In fact, all life was seen as an expression of divinity, including human love. Okay? And this is rooted in the Hindu principle of yoga and boga, B-H-O-G-A, physical pleasure. Okay? And these two will lead to the path of final liberation. Okay? So the uh, Hindus believe very much in this. Okay? So they are not necessarily seen as being in conflict right, to one another. Right? So, that's why you can see, you know, in India, you know, you can see why the nude, you know, has, you know, um, has become a, a kind of, um, um, is depicted more widely than the rest of Asia, okay, and that is one reason, right, okay, because it's kind of linked with their religion as well. Now, how about the Christian era? Okay, I, I mentioned Adam and Eve earlier. Now, in the Christian era, what you call the medieval period, from the fall of the Roman Empire to before the Renaissance, okay, it's what you call the medieval period. Okay, and during this period, right, nakedness was often seen as a sign of shame and humiliation. Okay, in fact, the human figure, the human form was not, uh, you know, um, very common in the medieval period, right, because all the emphasis was on the other world, okay? not, on, not on the earthly you know, existence. Okay? So humans were not considered to be important at all. Okay? So as a result, the human figure did not really feature so prominently in art like they were back in the days of the Greeks and the Romans. Okay? And it's said that in the medieval period, the nude became the naked. Right? The nude became the naked. Right, and in fact, the naked human figure is absent from medieval art except in sinful context. Okay, so perhaps the only sort of context in which the nude was allowed to be shown is in the context of Adam and Eve, right, and also in the context of the Last Judgment, okay, in scenes of the Last Judgment. Right? So in uh, some of the uh, medieval churches, like the Romanesque churches, right, you'll see um, scenes of the Last Judgment and with... Uh, all these puny, and the way that they depicted the naked human figure is, you know, is in a very fragile, puny, sort of frill manner. Okay, so that's how it was depicted in medieval, in a medieval period. Even Christ, the crucified Christ, is depicted clothes, right? 
during this time. So this is a, a sculpture you'll find in Notre Dame Cathedral. In, uh, oh, something just appeared there. In, uh, in Paris. Okay, and it depicts Adam and Eve. Okay, um, you know, this is when they were partaking the forbidden fruit, not necessarily an apple, okay, it's a fruit, right, causing them to sin, right, the sin of disobedience, because God told them expressly not to partake of the fruit from that particular tree, right. Okay, but we are still not quite sure huh, who's the guilty party, yeah? but I think here the artist makes it clear who the guilty one is, right. You can see it's clearly Eve. Do you all know why? Because the serpent, right, is also a female, right? Okay, and more importantly, he's looking at Eve, right? So Eve is the one who, you know, caused man to sin, all right? Okay. I know some people have issues, okay, I'm just, that's my opinion, right? Or at least how the artist depicts it, okay? But I want you to notice also the figures, right? Can you see that the figures are without form at all? Okay, I mean, without any anatomical details. Right? And interestingly, can you see that they're, they're private areas? Okay, their genital areas are, you know, uh, covered with fig leaf. Right? I don't know what leaves are those, but, you know, fig leaves. Okay, to cover their shame, their nakedness. Okay, I thought that was, you know, that was interesting. However, fast forward or rather, you know, going forward to the Renaissance. Almost the same, I mean, it's the theme of Adam and Eve, but here, you know, uh, it showed the, the, the two paintings or frescoes, right, show Adam and Eve being expelled from the Garden of Eden, okay, by an angel. Okay, so they were eventually expelled because of their disobedience. And you can see that the two figures, Adam and Eve, I mean, the two paintings, right, show the Adam and Eve both covered in shame, okay? I mean, they are, they are, you know, that's why, you know, nakedness, right, in the medieval period is associated with shame, with uh, disgrace, defeat, right? Okay, and you can see how, you know, the two Renaissance artists has depicted, right, Adam and Eve here, okay? Very famous um, painters, Masaccio and Michelangelo, okay? Masaccio was a highly influential um, Renais early Renaissance artist, and he's the one, you know, who really brought back bark and volume to the human figure. So if you look, notice the human figure here compared to the one, okay, that's shown in the previous slide. Okay, can you see, you know, that, you know, now the, the Masaccio has made humans seem human again, right? Okay, he has brought back bark and volume to the human figure. And likewise, you know, Masaccio was to influence many artists, which includes Michelangelo, right? And of course, that famous uh, painting by Michelangelo, is found in the Sistine Chapel, the one by Masaccio found in the Brancacci Chapel, right? Notice uh, Michelangelo's figures, okay? They are very muscular, right? Okay, even the, his woman, right? His female figures, female nudes seem very muscular, right? Because, you know, many of the artists at that time did not have access to female nudes, okay? So they use male nudes, right? Even for their female figures, right? So that explains, right, the kind of, you know, the, the, the muscular proportion of uh, Michelangelo's uh, female nudes. Interesting to actually to compare right, these, two, right, these two works. So what led to the revival of the nude in Renaissance art? Okay, firstly, you have the revival of uh, classical art. Okay, there's again a uh, reinterest in classical art. Okay, in Greek and Roman art. Okay, and secondly, there's what they call a revival of humanistic philosophy. Okay, I mean, there's, there's um, what, and it's, this is um, again understood by this term called humanism. Okay, where, you know, man, you know, the Greeks believe that man is the center of the universe. Right? Okay, so there's a lot of uh, 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 emphasis being placed on individual human dignity and worth. Right? So that's why the human figure the newt became very important again during the Renaissance. Okay, and in fact, the study of the newt became an indispensable part of the artist's training during the Renaissance. 
Okay. Um, okay, we'll talk about right that again, right, uh, in a while. Okay, um, just, just to add on to this, um, you know, for example, uh, Leonardo as well as Michelangelo, they were known to dissect bodies. They would cut out corpses, cadavers, right? Just so to get a better understanding of the musculature, the anatomy, right? So that they could become better draftsmen, right? And also at this time, the reclining newt, okay, which was to become, you know, a very common motif in Western art emerged during the Renaissance. Now this is one of the most famous right, uh, you know, um, work of the early Renaissance, okay, which is uh, okay, the uh, sculpture of David okay, by Donatello. Okay, and Donatello himself you know, is uh, widely considered to be one of the greatest Renaissance sculptors. Um, and this particular sculpture that was thought to have been commissioned by the Medici family, right, the famous uh, banking family in Florence, okay, who were great patrons of the arts. Um, and it was said to be the first large scale bronze nude sculpture since ancient times. So imagine from you know, classical times until then, right? Okay, there were no, in a, in a sense, sculpt nude sculptures done, right? Um, in the medium of bronze or even in any other medium. Okay. So what do you see here, David? Right? David, as you know, is a biblical figure. It's a figure in the Bible. Right, the story of David and Goliath, how David you know, killed the giant Goliath with a slingshot to his forehead. Okay, and later David was to become the king of Israel. Okay. But how did, or how does Don, Donatello depict David? Okay. Certainly not as a Jewish shepherd boy. Okay, here you can see that you know, um, he's only using, I suppose, this story as an excuse. You know, to, to do something that is very much rooted in classical art. Okay? He has not only revived the medium of bronze, okay, but he has also revived, for example, the pose, the contrapposto pose, okay, where um, the weight is borne on one leg, the other leg is relaxed. Right? If you can see here, the, the left leg is relaxed. There's a contrapposto pose. Okay? So he has revived the classical figure. Right? Now it's interesting the way, you know, if you look at this sculpture, how uh, the pose of David, you know, he stands, you know, with his left hand on, on his hip, okay, um, you know, and, and, you know, and he, he looks almost arrogant, I would say, do you think so, right? Having slain the giant, I mean, killed the giant Goliath and having decapitated him, you can see the head of Goliath at his foot, okay, and he carries a sword that is, uh, I think, too big for him. Okay, and he's, he wears a hat that is hardly a helmet. It's more a fashionable hat. Right? Okay. And if you look at it, you know, with all the kind of delicate curves of this uh, sculpture, okay, you would think that you know, there's an almost homoerotic quality to the painting. Right? And in fact, some would suggest that you know, this painting in fact um, reflects Donatello's own sexual orientation, if you know what I mean. Okay? of him himself as a homosexual, right? And I, I suppose, um, you know, uh, further kind of erotic qualities in this painting, uh, in this sculpture can be seen if you look at the close-up, the detail of, of the base of the sculpture, the head and David's feet. Okay, you can see that, you know, um, the beard of, uh, of the head of um, uh, Goliath, in fact, uh, tickles the toes Right of, you know, David's feet. Okay, then that has a kind of erotic connotation as well. Okay, I mean, some people read that into this, you know, this even this uh, particular uh, representation. Okay. So it's to be quite differently. You know, I mean, this, this I mean, there are there are three or four famous Davids in done during the Renaissance. Okay, and um, you know, this is very different from the one done by Michelangelo later on. Okay, and um, again, there's an essential difference in the way that male and female body 
or male and female nudes are depicted in art before the 19th century. Okay, men are typically shown as active, women are shown as uh, more passive, more languorous, right, in a way. Okay, and female nudes are also shown frequently asleep or being spied on, okay, or sometimes they would acknowledge the viewer. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about this, okay, like, you know, the sleeping Venus, okay, by Giorgione. Now, Giorgione was an important, um, you know, I mean, he's the f really one of the first great artists in that long line of very distinguished Venetian artists. You know, you have Giorgione, then you have Titian, and then Giovanni Bellini, right? Okay, that's kind of the great line of Venetian artists. Um, so here, you, I mean, how do we know that it's a Venus? There's no attribute to prove that you know, this figure is a Venus. Right? I think for that, you have to do an X-ray of the, of the painting. Okay, because I think X-ray revealed that there's, there used to be a small Cupid figure, okay, somewhere, but I don't know, maybe when it was restored, it was overpainted. Okay, so that's how we know that, you know, this is actually a Venus. Okay, and really this figure of the reclining nude was to set the standard, okay, for the reclining nude in Western art. Alright, but you can see that here, Giorgione's reclining nude Right, takes place in an outdoor setting, within a landscape. All right. And it also shows her closing her eyes, probably sleeping. Right. Um, and you know, so when we look at this nude, okay, we actually become the voyeur. Okay? Okay, we are the voyeur looking at her because she's uh, unaware that you know, we are looking at a body, right? at, a, at, a, at, a, at a naked body. Okay? And this is typical of the reclining nude, right? You can see, you know, it's very languorous, okay? And it's uh, shown with a kind of inviting pose as well, right? And I mean, the, the kind of eroticism or sensuality of this figure is enhanced you know, by the pose of the figure. You can see that, you know, her right hand is, um, you know, is now used as a support for her head. And again, by doing that, you know, it exposes her breast, you know, to the viewer. And interestingly, if you look at the left hand, you know, to you it might seem that her left hand is actually, you know, uh, doing a kind of a modest gesture, is covering her genital area. But actually, you can read it as, you know, her her hand pointing our eyes, leading us our eyes to that area as well, right? So you know, it depends on how okay, you see this uh, particular um, uh, nude. Okay, and. The kind of sensuality is also enhanced, I, I think, by the contrast of textures, okay, by the smoothness of the body with the kind of the, 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 the deep red velvet and the, the silver uh, satin sheets okay, that she's lying on. Okay? And I suppose Giorgione also, by situating her in a landscape setting, wants to show that she's also at one with nature. Okay? So you can see that her, the delicate curves of her body actually echo, right? the curves of the hill, right, in the landscape. Okay, talking about influence, I mean, of course, you know, um, Titian was a, a pupil of Giorgione, right? And here, clearly, you can see that, oh, it's, it's said that, um, you know, this painting was unfinished when Giorgione died, and uh, Titian actually um, helped to complete the landscape, okay? That's uh, one view of this painting. Okay, and that's uh, Titian, arguably the most famous uh, Venetian or the greatest Venetian painter, right? And this is entitled Venus of Abino. Okay, now Abino, of course, is a place in uh, in, in in Italy, right? And you know there, there's a, a kind of a debate about this painting, right? Who is this woman? Right, we are not sure as to you know. I mean, we know that she's Venus, right? But you know, who's the model here? Okay, we are not, again, very sure. Who commissioned this work? Okay, now there's speculation that it was commissioned by the Duke of Abino for his young wife. Okay, I don't know whether he was recently married, but, you know, but who will commission a nude, you know, for your wife, right? Okay, so, so you know, we are not sure about that. Um, but if you look at, for example, um, you know, the, can you see the servants in the background going through a chest, okay. That's what you call in Italy or Italian the cassoni, okay. Is that right, Lucia? Cassoni, 
Let's say it's Italian. <laughs> okay. It's a chest. It's a chest that was uh, traditionally given away as a, as a wedding gift or, or some sort. Okay. And the dog you see there, right, at the foot of the bed, is supposed to be a symbol of uh, conjugal fidelity, marital fidelity. Okay. So there are all these kind of um, you know, motifs that lead one to think that this painting is probably an allegory of some sort, right? Probably an allegory of marriage. Okay? But we cannot confirm that. Okay, but all we can say is that it depicts a newt, okay, a reclining newt. Okay, she's reclined or reclining on, on a bed. Okay. And uh, now what identifies her as Venus here? There's no golden apple, there's no cupids around. Okay, anyone? Can see that she's carrying on in her right hand a posse of flowers. Now those flowers are roses. Okay? So roses are another attribute of Venus. Okay, so that, that identifies her as, as a Venus. Okay, and um, here you can see that you know in terms of uh, pose, it's quite similar to that of uh, Giorgioni. Right? You can see the left hand again covering her genital area. Right? But really, I mean, if you look at Titian's painting, so he's really um, very well known for the hand, his handling of the brush and the paint. Okay, the way that you know, he is able to um, you know, um, sort of depict his uh, figures with very sensuous brush strokes right? and very warm colours. Okay, and, so, and that's because you know, in, in, in Titian's uh, uh, paintings, he used a lot of glazes. Right? This word glazes, right? Glazes, glazes are what you call and he used layers and layers of uh, very thin, transparent right, oil paint. Okay? So that gives, imparts a certain uh, smoothness and sensuousness right, to his figures. Okay? And unlike Giorgione's um, nude, you can see that this Venus is wide awake. Right? It's not sleeping at all. Right? It's looking at us. Okay? So you have to think which is more erotic then? Okay? Whether the nude is engaging us directly. Right. I'm not so sure about the female audience, all right? but the male audience, okay, when you look at the nude, right? okay, or when the nude is asleep. Okay. So here, you know, she's looking at us uh, rather seductively. Okay. And, uh, right, so this is... Um, and I think more than Giorgione's uh, uh, um, Venus, right? the Venus of Rabino was really to be you know, a great influence Right, because it's taking place in a domestic interior. Okay, so it was to be a, a, a very important influence on you know, other reclining nudes that we see later on in Western art. Okay, the ones by, for example, Velasquez and you know, other artists. Right? I think there's a, do you all have the quote, this quote? In, okay, now it's supposed to be by Leon Battista Alberti. I think that's a irata, right, in the handout. Okay, Leon Battista Alberti, who is uh, really an artist, an architect, an art theorist. Okay, this is what he says. Before the dress, dressing a man, we, might, we first draw him nude, then we unfold him in draperies. Right, okay, so that's what they do in the, you know, in the workshops during the Renaissance. Okay, where they, they learn first to draw okay um you know um the nude right so the nude became a very important study right from the renaissance onwards okay and drawing from the life model okay was to become increasingly important as well okay talking about michelangelo again right okay this um work right as you know is again from the sistine chapel Okay, one of the scenes, you know, one of the main scenes. And it depicts um, the, you know, God creating or rather separating the sun and the moon. Right? Now, you know, Michelangelo really set the standard for the male nude. Right? Okay? And he was really quite obsessed huh, with, the, with the human figure. Right? Or with the naked human figure. Okay? And, uh, you know, even in the Sistine Chapel, 
you know, I mean, you know, the Pope, in fact, initially wanted him to just, uh, well, you know, paint the 12 apostles, but he ended up painting about more than 300 figures, okay, some of which I actually knew it, right, okay, and, you know, if you look at this work, now there's God there, right, drawn in what you call a foreshortened perspective, okay, on the right, you can see God, you know, separating the moon, all right, and the sun, okay, but on the left, you also see God from the back, and you can see that Michelangelo has the, you know, he dared to portray God naked, right? Or at least, you know, you can, you can see that his uh, bottoms are showing, right? Okay, now I'm, I'm not sure what the, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church or the Church at that time thought about this. Okay, I'm sure there would be, have been some controversy. Okay, okay, but later on I'm going to show you another painting of his called The Last Judgment, right? There was a lot of controversy about that because of his, uh, many, his many nude figures, okay? Okay, but I suppose one of the controversies is what are these nude figures, you know, right, doing in a, a religious context, in a religious painting, right? Because it's considered to be obscene and immoral. Okay? Let alone, you know, uh, pagan figures, because Michelangelo also included pagan figures, like the Sibyls, right, on the Sistine Chapel. Okay, but anyway, coming back to this, all right, also you'll notice the, what you call, can you see the four figures that frames the scene? Okay, that shows the, the figures in a contorted manner. Right, those are what you call the ignudis. Right, the ignudis are really a kind of invention of Michelangelo. Um, you know, and, and again, you know, uh, it begs the, the question of why did he include ignudis in a religious painting? Okay, and I, I suppose the answer can be found in that, you know, Michelangelo was so, you know, obsessed with the human figure, he celebrated, right, the human body, okay, so much that, you know, he probably included, included them here, okay. And, you know, it, and it really shows the range of Michelangelo's artistic skills and innovation through the new. Okay, and the study of the new became the basis of art training in the art academies from the 16th century onwards. Right. Um, however, okay, I have to point out that, um, okay, later on maybe I'll, I'll tell you more about this, right? Okay, were there, you know, uh, nude uh, male or female models, right? In fact, many of the, the nude models, right, in these art schools, art academ academies, uh, were actually male. Okay, female models were not allowed until much later, right, in the 19th century. Okay, um, and, and, unless I suppose in you know in more in, in more private studios, okay, but in the art schools and academies, okay, they use uh, mostly um, you know male nude models, okay, and students were instructed in drawing from the live model, or from classical sculptures. Okay. Now, who is the greatest painter of the nude? Okay. Now, who do you consider the greatest painter? Of the nude? Maybe you have a different opinion. Uh, Mr. Choi, who do you consider to be the greatest painter of the nude? There are so many great artists. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. That's a very safe answer, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree totally. It's difficult. Okay, but, but to me, I mean, uh, you know, that's only one man's opinion is uh, Ang or Angre. Okay, Jean Agas Dominic Ang. Okay, a neoclassical painter. Okay, undoubtedly, you know, Ang has been recognized as one of the best draftsmen who ever lived. Okay, and certainly one of the greatest, if not the greatest, painter of the new. Right? Okay, and uh, he, you know, he did quite a number of uh, paintings of the new. Okay, and many of his nudes are, in, in, uh, you know, are disguised as, for example, goddesses or as uh, orderlies. You know, orderlies are what you call concubines you know, in, the, in the harem. Right? And he, you know, his, his nudes are also known for their very smooth skin or textures. You know? You know, as Ang himself said, you know, painting must be as smooth okay, uh, as an onion. Right? Um, okay, and here, you know, and, and, his, and his nudes are, in a sense, um, you know, he was a great admirer of classical art, okay? Um, you know, so, so you can see that, you know, he also stressed the importance of dry, drawing from the life model, okay? And one significant thing to note, if you look at 
Ang's new is his mastery of line and form. Okay, the mastery of line and form, okay, is very evident, right, in his news. Okay, now this news, this particular new depict again Venus, right? Venus, what they call Venus rising. Okay, again, it's another name for the birth of Venus. Okay, Venus rising from the sea. Okay, and um, you know here he, again, Ang shows a very, uh, you know, in kind of alabaster skin. You know. Uh, Venus, right, uh, standing in a, a, a you know a contrapostal pose. Okay, again, you know, with her sort of wringing her hair, as you can see. Okay, and with a right hand, you know, going over her left, her head. Okay, you can see again that, you know, her breasts are presented to us frontally. Okay, and you can see the putti again surrounding her. Right, and again, it was under Ang's influence. Okay, I mean, his name can be pronounced as either Ang or Angra. Okay, it was under his influence that, um, you know, um, female nude models began to supplement male models in the art schools. Right, so it was under his influence that, you know, gradually, right, you have female nude models being introduced into the art school. Right. You know, in fact, uh, as late as the 19th century, you know, even in the Royal Academy, right, Okay, students have limited, even male students, I won't say female, male students have very limited access to female nude models. Okay, there's a criteria here. Okay, firstly, they have to be married and then they have to be above 20 years old. Okay, so that's a criteria. Okay, right, for you to have access to female nude models. Right, in the Royal Academy, that was in the late 19th century. Okay, uh, I think I need to speed it up a bit more. Okay, to talk about uh, gender and, you know, the nude, okay, and uh, representation of gender. Now, if you look at it, right, I think I have a, or should I go straight away? Maybe, hmm. yeah, okay, maybe I'll go, you know, I'll talk about this and then I'll go back. Okay, now this poster says it all, right? If you go to the, Museum of Modern Art, right? 85% of the nudes are female, right? But less than 5% of the artists are actually female. Okay, now there's a poster, a very witty poster by the Guerrilla Girls, right? Now the Guerrilla Girls are, you know, their, their identities are anonymous, okay? But what they do is that they don gorilla masks, you know, the, the play of the word guerrilla and gorilla. Okay, they don gorilla masks, but they employ gorilla tactics. Okay, and they would go outside, right? They would um, hold some protests, they would uh, distribute uh, stickers and posters. Okay, they would um, sometimes make use of billboards, okay, to highlight uh, racial as well as, uh, in particular, sexual, uh, you know, deep, uh, what they call inequalities in the arts. Okay. Okay, coming back to this, so you can see that, you know, most of the nudes in art are actually female. And, of course, they were made for men, right? They were done by male artists for a male audience, right? Okay, so here we are talking what you call about, you know, um, some people call the gaze, the male gaze, right? The male gaze, okay? There's a kind of sexual exchange between, okay, the subject who is depicted and the viewer. Okay, who is um, again assumed to be male. You know, this is a work by, uh, sorry, a quote by Linda Noshlin. Right? And Linda Noshlin, in the wake of the feminist consciousness in the 1970s, wrote a very seminal essay called uh, Why Are There No Great Women Artists? Now, if you have a chance, you can read that. Okay, that's available for free on the internet. Okay, and this is what she says. You know, um, you know, it says image, imagery of sexual delight or provocation has always been created about women for men's enjoyment by men. Okay, and I think uh, there's this uh, author called John Berger, right, in his book called Ways of Seeing. Okay, also has a lot to say, right, about this so-called male gaze.
Okay, and the fact that only the female is present in the sexual scene is significant. Right? Um, you know, so that, you know, here, uh, I suppose, you know, the, the new female figure is then, is then available, right, for the viewer who gazes upon her and consumes her <laughs> without being seen. So we have already seen that, you know, in some of the examples I showed you earlier, like the Venus of Bino and the Sleeping Venus. Okay, and uh, and this can be seen no, it can nowhere be better seen than in this work by Francisco Goya. Okay, because uh, you know here you have actually two paintings, one done earlier than another. One is closed, one is naked, if you want to call it, or nude. Okay, and but both of the same subject. Okay, now we don't know who this particular um, uh, person is. Okay, the subject. Okay, it's, she's thought to be the mistress of uh, the um, the prime minister of Spain, Manuel uh, Godoy. Right, and in fact, uh, it was said that the the nude version hung in his palace. Okay, presumably for his own enjoyment. Right, and he probably has the closed version somewhere close as well. Right, okay, when he felt like it, right, he would look at it. Okay, the closed version first, and then. Okay, the new version. Okay, some speculated that you know it represented um, Goya's mistress, the Duchess of Alba, A L B A. Okay, but we are not sure, right, as to the identity of the sitter. Okay, but what we are, what can we can be um, sure of is that it's quite a provocative painting, right? I mean, here you can see that you know she's um, reclining again. Okay, but with both her arms behind her head, okay, exposing again her, you know, not only her breast but her pubic area to us, to the viewer. Okay, for us as you know, I, I mentioned earlier, to consume, uh, not for us but more for the male audience, right? To consume her. Okay, and we have a quote there. Okay, that states that this is the first totally profane, life-size female nude in Western art. Okay, that's a, a big word to use, profane. Now, what, what led you know, this critic to say that? Okay, because this is the first painting, if you look closely, all right, this is the first painting where the pubic hair is visible. Okay, probably the first beauty painting where you know, the pubic hair is actually shown. Okay, so it must have caused certain you know, sort of uh, shock in some people when they saw this work. Okay, so this painting has that kind of notoriety okay, for, you know, for, for that uh, uh, fact. Okay, another great painter of the new, I mean, you, you wouldn't, we always know Degas as you know, a painter of ballet dancers. Okay, but he was also uh, known for his extraordinary series of uh, uh, you know, drawings and, you know, and, and pastels of, of nudes. Okay, um, and this is one of them. Okay, woman in the top. Right? And, you know, Degas was an artist who, you know, want to make his figures appear that, or rather his, his paintings or his drawings appear that, you know, they were done spontaneously. Okay, or rather the figures in his paintings, you know, he wants to show them in, in certain spontaneous action. Right? Okay, like uh, this figure here. Um, woman bathing. Okay, you can see here Degas has departed from the reclining nude. Okay, he has uh, situated situated this uh, her in a very believable context. She's actually uh, sort of uh, drying, uh, probably you know bathing, you know in the act of bathing, right? And he's very much um, focused on the physicality, right, of the figure. Okay, but if you look at the figure. You can see that she's very self-absorbed, right? She's very self-absorbed. She's oblivious, okay, uh, you know, to, to the fact that she's been, you know, gazed upon, right? So again, that places us in a position of a voyeur, right? Looking at her bathing, right? Okay, and he says that, you know, Hitherto the, the nude has always been represented in poses which presuppose an audience. But these women of mine are unconcerned by any other interests other than those involved in their 
physical condition. Okay? Now, to a certain extent, it's right and, and also wrong, you know, because there is an audience, because the audience, as I said, is a male audience, right, looking at this painting. Wow, <laughs> this is something, okay, now we'll, we'll talk more about this, but again, you know, in the 19th century, right, um, you know, you have, you have a transition, okay, there was a transition, you know, from, you know, I mean, from the Renaissance, you know, up to the 19th century, the early part of the 19th century, um, you know, art was very much dominated by the academic tradition, by what was taught in the art schools, okay, so, you know, a lot of paintings were done in a very, academic, traditional, classical way, okay? Until, um, you know, um, certain um, French painters like Gustave Courbet emerged, okay? With their more realistic style of painting, okay? And people like Courbet wanted to rebel against that academic, you know, sort of tradition of painting, okay? So Courbet was a realist, Okay, and you know, I mean, we are not surprised that being a realist, you know, he would depict this in a very realistic manner, right? So this work itself, you know, is, is really, um, I would say, it has a pecu peculiar fascination because of his daring and his, uh, his, his, his audacity, right? In being, you know, being, being, trying to show, you know, the genital area, you know, in such a resting close-up, okay? So this leads us to the question of, of whether, you know, such a work um, is pornography. All right. Okay, I mean, it leads all, to all sorts of questions. All right. Okay, I mean, you know, I mean, what was the difference between this and pornography, for example? Right. Okay, and I suppose that can be easily answered because unlike, you know, the pornography, pornography that we know, Okay, which has little artistic intent or merit. Okay, this work, in fact, has a lot of artistic intent and merit. Okay, we can admire, for example, the virtuosity of, you know, of Corbett's brushwork. Okay, the kind of the refinement of his, uh, his color scheme. Okay, all of this, I think, you know, um, help the work evade a kind of pornographic status. Right? Okay, but that's debatable again, right? Okay, whether, you know, when, when is work, you know, pornography and when is it not? Okay, but I think the, the artistic intent and merit, okay, are important considerations. Oh, by the way, you know, as uh, recent as uh, 2009 in Portugal, right, uh, I think there was a bookshop which, uh, you know, has a book displayed on its uh, window, uh, you know, is is window right at the front of the shop, okay? And the book cover, okay, has in fact this painting as is 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 cover, and you know the authorities came and confiscated it, right? I mean, at least it was not shown, right? You know, I mean that's in Portugal, right? So you can see that again, you know, nudity is quite a sensitive subject, right? Even in a you know European country. Um, do I have up to one and a half hours? Or? Okay, I'll try my best, right? Okay, thank you. No, I don't like to be rushed, because once I rush, okay, yeah. I mean, I'll try to, to finish, you know, as, as soon as I can. Um, oh, yeah, okay, I mean, this should have been the slide earlier, right? As I mentioned, right? You know, I mean, artists like Corbet, uh, you know, the Impressionists as well, right? Challenge the tradition of the idealized female nude. Right? They created very unidealized nudes that you saw right earlier on. Okay, like even Degas' work, right? Okay, is uh, you know is considered to be a very unidealized nude. And this as well, okay, a very unidealized nude. Okay, and this painting was to create a lot of controversy. Okay, Edward Manet, Olympia. He has a very classical title, Olympia. Okay, and you can see that, you know, um, Manet again, you know, and this painting is, you know, um, I suppose it's, it's a, it's a, comes from a long line of that so-called reclining nude tradition. Okay, like the one painted by uh, Titian, Venus of Urbino. Okay, in fact, I suppose this painting is a reinterpretation of Titian's Venus of Urbino. Okay, 
But why was it? Why is it so, so shocking? You know, I mean, people have been used to the reclining nude for a long time. Okay, and there, there was not a lot of controversy. Because many place this so-called nude, okay, or some say naked, all right, female, in a very contemporary context, in a very believable context. Okay, it is what they call emphatically contemporary. Now that's a problem. Okay, and that's the cause of the controversy. Okay, because um, you know, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a model. You know, this is not a Venus, right? This is not some you know a, a goddess. This is someone who many parishions have probably known or will have seen. And her, we, all, we even know her by name, Victorine, okay, who posts you know, uh, quite frequently for many. Okay? And you know, the, the contemporary audience who, who saw this will probably know the context as well that this figure is being depicted as a prostitute. Okay? A prostitute. Okay? And it's clearly seen, I mean, it's clear that you, know, you can see that you know, you, on the right you can see a male ser a female, a, a black servant holding a, a bouquet of flowers, probably from a client. Okay? And unlike the dog in the Venus or Urbino, here you can see a black cat. Can you see a black cat on the right? Okay? With its uh, kind of erotic implications. Okay? And I mean, that, that is only part of the controversy. And of course, the other controversy is the way that it is the techniques of Manet's painting, right? Okay, where you know, he didn't bother with gradations of tone and all that. Right? You can see, if you look at his uh, nude, more, nude figures, right, they are rather flat. Okay, right? So they were not even painted in the traditional way. Okay, that's what shocked people as well. And the fact that if you look at the pose, right, she's, her head is sort of propped up upright. And she's gazing at us in a very defiant manner. Okay? Right. So that's what, you know, all these things, you know, created a controversy at that time. <laughs> so, while Manet's work is a reinterpretation of, v, uh, you know, Titian's Venus or Reno, here we have Morimura reinterpreting, in turn, Manet's Olympia. Okay? Or some, some would say parodying, right? Okay, Manis Olympia. Right. Now, Morimura is a, is a contemporary Japanese artist. Okay, and um, you know, in many of his works, I mean, he's most famous for his works where you know, he actually um, you know, um, inserts himself into famous images or famous works of art. Okay, right, so you can see that you know, sometimes he even uh, you know, takes over uh, the faces of uh, Marilyn Monroe or Michael Jackson. Okay, but here you can see that this is a, a in fact, it's a photograph with some, you know, uh, paint touches. Okay, it's, it's mostly a color photograph. Okay, and you can see that, you know, he often, of course, he has to, to, to wear sort of makeup and costume, right? Okay, as he does here, where he wears a blonde wig. Okay, now, is this a prank? Okay, I mean, to you, it may seem like a prank, right? Morimura is playing a, playing a prank. Okay, but I suppose, you know, not all works of art are that simple. Okay, in fact, many works of art are actually quite complex. Okay, you have to ask yourself, what is the artist trying to convey by doing this? Okay, in fact, if you look at, and for that, you have to look at his other works as well. Right, and here, you know, Morimura used his works, okay, like this one called Futago. Futago, I believe, is a Japanese term for twins. Okay, I actually he wanted to relate this work to the, I suppose, to the work of, uh, of Manet. Or rather, he also can also refer to um, the two figures here, because these two figures are in fact Morimura himself, even the black servant girl. Right? Okay. So this work, you know, some people see it as a critique, a critique of, you know, firstly, gender identity. Okay, and secondly, racial identity. Okay, I mean, I deal with the first one, which is easier, right? Now, I mean, who is he trying to fool? Okay, we know that this is not a woman, right? Although he wears a wig, because, you know, he has no breasts. I mean, he has breasts, but, you know, okay? Not like a woman's breasts. Um, he lacks what he call, you know, uh, the male genital, right? 
Okay, so what is he trying to say here? Now, this work in, in a sense is trying to subvert what you call the fixed categories of what we know as male and female. Okay, the fixed sexual categories of male and female. Right? Okay, and he's trying to say that, you know, um, this these binaries are not fixed, but rather they are, they are fluid. Okay, so there, there can be other categories that are in between. Okay, these fixed categories of male and female. Okay, and today we know, you know, uh, terms like transgender, for example. Right, okay, that defies these fixed binaries or fixed categories. Right, um, Okay, and then racial identity, you know, of course, you know, by taking on the role of, uh, you know, a Western uh, figure, right, and also taking on the role of a black uh, servant, okay, he's um, in a sense trying to invert, okay, this kind of, uh, the, the, the dominant relationship between the colonized and the colonizer, okay, between the Western and the Asian, okay, because, you know, X, that's Morimura for both Right, the black servant and the white uh, so-called female figure. Okay. Um, Alice Neal. Uh, now you know, in the nineteen seventies, right, there was a feminist consciousness that emerged in the United States. Okay, and because of this feminist consciousness. Um, art historians, for example, began to write books about women artists. Curators started to organize shows uh, by women artists. And women artists themselves began to be rediscovered, okay? like Alice Neal. I mean, Alice Neal was rediscovered when she was in her 70s. Okay? But she's now you know, acknowledged as one of the greatest uh, or, you know, or best known painters right, in the US. Okay? She's known primarily for nudes. Okay, and for the subtleties of expression and color that you see in the works. Now, this particular um, work shows is entitled Pregnant Woman. Okay, in fact, images of childbirth and pregnancy have been uh, quite common since ancient times. Okay, and in this work, she shows the physical effects of pregnancy on both the body and the self. Okay, and um, now, if you s look carefully, you can see that, you know, um, the erect nipples of this figure and a swollen belly, you know, is contrasted with the rather bony arms and the ribs we show through the skin. Okay, and the rather pink, red flush belly, right, contrasting with the yellow tones of the rest of the body. Okay, so here you can see that she, play, she plays with contrast, right? But you can look at the expression of the figure. She looks dazed, fearful, confused. I don't know why, you know, right? But then you see a head pop up behind her. A male head. <laughs> okay? I, now, we don't know exactly who that person is. Right? Okay, but, you know, some suggest that, you know, he's there to show that, you know, uh, to show man's role in this whole process of, you know, pregnancy. Right? To show that men can be both, uh, you know, uh, protective as well as possessive. Okay, men can be both distant as well as uh, intimate. Okay, so that could be one reading of the work. But again, this work, pregnant woman. I mean, you know, this is not a common theme in Western art, right? Okay, so this has nothing to do again with the idealized nude that we have so, you know, we have we have, we have become used to, right? Okay, where Alice Neal dared to show the kind of effects of pregnancy on a woman's body. Okay, I think we are nearing the end. All right. Um, now, the, the, the modern movements, right? Uh, in, a, in a sense, when we approach the beginning of the 20th century, okay, modern artists approach the nude in radically different ways. Okay, because, you know, modern artists um, themselves were to rebel against you know, tradition, right? Okay, they, they you know, and, and you see, for example, um, you know, abstract art, okay, beginning to be dominant in the 20th century, all right? So, modern art, right, dispense with the aim of making the nude a thing of beauty, 
In fact, some modern artists celebrated ugliness. Okay? So they will not hesitate, for example, uh, you know, to elongate or distort the body. Okay? And of course, you have a changing role of women in society, a certain frankness towards sex, rise of feminism. Okay? All these play a part okay, in how women is depicted and seen. Okay? Um, this is a, a famous work by Pablo Picasso. And you know Picasso's attitude towards women is quite ambivalent. Okay? All right. One, you know, um, in some of his paintings you can see that you know, he actually uh, treats a woman like a goddess, right? Okay? As a kind of goddess. But others, in other paintings, it's sort of brutalized, right? Okay, his female subjects. Right? That's his ambivalent attitude towards women. And you can see it clearly here in this very famous work called Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Okay? Depicting five naked women or specifically five naked prostitutes right? in a brothel in Barcelona. Okay? And with this painting, Picasso has once and for all shattered the Western tradition. Okay? You can see here he has dispensed totally with the use of a linear perspective. Okay? He has uh, fragmented the pictures so much so that you know, space becomes uh, undefined and ambiguous. Right? You can see that he has um, deformed and distorted his figures. Okay, so much so that you, know, you can see that you know, the whole painting is dominated by you know, jagged sort of uh, angular forms. Right? And now if you look at, um, you know, so here, you know, this painting does not conform with your, your usual notion of beautiful. What is, you know, what is the beautiful beauty in art? Okay, here, in fact, you know, Picasso is depicting the ugly. Okay, and especially the two on the right, okay, you can see that, you know, that they, they, they have a kind of mask-like faces. Okay, and that's because you know, he was very much influenced by African or primitive art. Right? Okay, so that accounts you know, for the fact that, okay, that the two figures on the right okay, look very different from the three other figures on the left. Okay, okay I need, need to go on without talking too much. Okay, um, this is a work by Matisse. Okay. And likewise, Matisse, you know, he, he's, he's, a, he's a modern master. Okay. He's the only one whom uh, Picasso considered to be his rival, in fact. Okay. Um, you know, and, and you know, in Matisse's work, you, you know, certain qualities are quite evident. Okay. You always see, for example, the, um, that he always um, simplifies the figure. Okay, not only simplify, but radically simplify his figure. Okay? So much so that you know, um, extraneous details become or are eliminated. Okay? So you don't see, for example, you know, um, anatomical details in this work. Okay? And also, you know, you, what you notice in Marty's work is also the line, okay? the use of line, the kind of rhythmic, sinuous line that he used. Okay? Um, you know, that, that gives his work, I think, a kind of poetic quality. Uh, the kind of rhythmic quality. Now, do you dare to say that you know this work is ugly? You know, right? Um, you know, but you know, we, when we look at this work, I mean, of course, you know, he has um, exaggerated the figure. He has, in fact, even distorted it. I mean, you know, the arms are, are you know, way too big in proportion to the body and even the legs. Okay? But you can see his mastery of the use of the delicate curving lines okay? imparts in, his fig in this figure a kind of sensuality, a kind of poetic beauty. Right? That is not far from the kind of classical beauty that we know of. Okay? And this was a work that well, people were not so shocked by the work. In fact, at the end of the performance, you know, they were all kind of, uh, they thought that it was an excellent show. Okay? Now, this is a work by the French artist. He's actually more a showman, right? A showman, a performance artist, a painter, Yves Klein. Okay? And this is um, one of his uh, most famous, I won't say controversial work, right? in which um, he actually got three models Okay? 
and they are all very beautiful models yeah. with beautiful bodies, right? Okay, in front of I think about hundred people, and hundred people are all dressed in it's like a black tie affair, you know, right? Okay, in formal suits. Okay, and then they came, they sat in the audience, and even called, uh, you know, even had a symphony there, his own very monotone symphony, right? Okay, and this symphony only plays one note. Okay, plays one note for 20 minutes, followed by another 20 minutes of silence. Right? Okay, so in this, uh, I would call this a performance rather than a painting. Okay, what happens is that the nudes would then be covered, smeared with paint, and then as you can see on, in the picture, they will be doing things like dragging along the canvas. Okay, and as they do that, you can see on the right, okay, traces or imprints of their bodies, okay, on the canvas, right? Okay, now, so, and, you know, for this work, right, Klein only used a certain type of blue, what they call IKB, International Klein Blue, patented by the artist himself, right? And in some of his performances or his shows, he will also serve blue cocktail, right? Okay. <laughs> so imagine when you pass out later on, right, what colour your, you know, right, your, you know, your sort of, the, 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 the fluid or the liquid will be. So, you know, there was no controversy. In fact, people, you know, enjoyed it and applauded this work, right, at the end. Okay, although I don't, I don't know whether the, the orchestra themselves, you know, can concentrate, you know, right, okay, by having this performance in front of them. Okay, I think I just want to show, yeah, just a few more, sorry. Um, just want to make sure. Okay, just a few more slides. You, you can bear with me, right? This is a very famous work. Now, if you want to know about contemporary Southeast Asian art, this is a work that you have to know. Okay, Ken Dadis. Okay, Ken Dadis. Um, this is a work by the Indonesian artist called Jim Supankat. Okay, Jim Supankat. And, you know, Jim Supankat was an, an artist, a uh, curator, and a writer. Okay, and in this exhibition in 1975, okay, as part of the new art movement, Okay, the new art movement comprised um, artists who wanted to rebel against, um, you know, traditional Indonesian art like painting and sculpture. Okay, they were mainly what they call experimental and conceptual artists. Okay, the new art movement, right? And in this work, um, Ken Dadis, right, is actually the subject is actually a queen, a 14th century um, Javanese queen. Okay, and um, now what, what um, Supanka did was that he created um, you know, a, a bust, it's more than a bust, it comprised a head as well as the, the upper shoulders or torso. Okay, so you can see the, the, the top part comprised of you know, a, a, a kind of a sculpture. All right? And that sculpture is based on a very famous um, sculpture okay, that you see on your right. Okay? The Prashna Paramita, right? Uh, statue and and then you can see at the, at the, uh, on, on the bottom half of that work is, is a plinth right and on the plinth there's a kind of a drawing okay of a very sexy sort of erotic torso okay with part of the breast shown wearing tight fitting western jeans and you can see that the jeans are unbuttoned as well to show a little bit of the pubic hair Okay. So when this work was first shown, it created a lot of controversy, okay, especially in a Muslim country, okay, like Indonesia. Okay. But since then, you know, it has become uh, quite uh, a seminal work okay, because you say that this work marked the, what you call the contemporary turn. It marked the kind of the beginning of contemporary art. Okay. Not only in Indonesia, but I think you know, um, in the context of Southeast Asia. Right? Now, what is Supanka trying to do here or to say here with this work? Okay? I mean, it's quite clear that you know, um, he's trying to talk about the effects of modernization or modernity or Indonesian society, right? where, for example, Western decadence right, has kind of you know, um, replaced the kind of glorified past of Indonesia as exemplified. Okay, by the famous sculpture that we see on the right. 
Okay, so this is a very interesting work, but also very controversial. Now this is not the original. This work is now with the Singapore Museum. Okay, the original has been destroyed. Okay, this is a copy of the original work. Okay. Now I mentioned the feminist consciousness that emerged in the 1970s. Okay, and one of um, the, the um, kind of feminist artists who you know practice in the wake of that feminist consciousness is Anna Mendieta. Okay, she's a feminist, uh, uh, a Cuban feminist artist, right? And at that time, um, you know, feminists accepted and they celebrated the notion that women actually have a deeper identification with nature than men. Okay, and this was demonstrated in, in some works done in the 1970s okay, by feminist artists. And Anna Mendetta was a follower of a certain type of religion, okay, a kind of Cubo African religion okay, that emphasized immersion in nature. Okay, so that's what she did here with this series called Tree of Life. Okay, now, in this particular work, okay, it's a kind of a ritualistic performance. Right, in this particular work, you can see that she covers her new body with mud. Okay? She stands um, against the tree with her hands upraised, okay? like, a, like a goddess, right? at, you know, and shows that she's at one with nature. Right? And she considered nature to be her maternal source. Right? Because, you know, again, you know, feminists wants to reclaim okay, that, that kind of... Uh, you know that that the, the fact that you know um, you know nature, okay, was or, or the earth was originally originally thought of as you know a, a female form, an earth goddess, not a male form that we know today. Okay, so there are all these issues that actually preoccupied feminist artists during that time. Okay, they wanted again, as I mentioned, to assert the female body. Okay, and so. If you look at the 70s, many, in fact, quite a number of um, female artists, in fact, um, you know, uh, um, perform in a nude, right? Okay, this is one of them. Okay, um, and this is uh, Robert Hughes, who's talking about um, Sigmund Freud. Okay, and, um, you know, he says that it's unlikely that any painter since Picasso has made his figuring of the naked human body such an intense and unsettling experience for the viewer as Lucian Freud. Okay. Right, and Lucian Freud, you know, as you know, is the, the, is the grandson of uh, the famous Sigmund Freud. Okay, right, the father of psychoanalysis. Right. And you know, before his death, I think about two years ago or a few years back, right, he's, cons you know, he's uh, widely considered to be the greatest living painter. Okay. And if you know the works of Sigmund Freud, he likes to paint not only the nude, but he likes to paint flesh. Okay. So you see a lot of flesh in his work. Okay. So he has thoroughly reworked the nude in his work, okay. which is quite different from the classical nude that we know of. Um, and he, he says himself, you know, I don't paint people, I paint flesh, right? And he has a lot of flesh to paint here, okay, in this work. Um, in fact, this work was once the highest price uh, fetch at an auction for a living artist. I think it was sold for 33 million or so, right? Okay, and unlike many of Freud's other nudes, Okay, we know this, the identity of this particular nude, Sue Tilly, or she's also known as Big Sue. Okay, she weighs a hefty 127 kg. Right? <laughs> you can see that you know, her frame or her bulk barely contains, right? or, or the, rather the sofa you know, can barely contain her bulk and, and her frame. Right? Okay, and I suppose you know, if not for the sumptuousness of Freud's handling of the brush, you know, Okay, uh, you know, I think many of his works will be considered to be quite grotesque. Okay, but it, because it could paint so beautifully, you know, it could suggest the mortal flesh tones, you know, the contrasting textures of the different parts of the body. Okay, that, that makes his uh, work, you know, in a sense, um, you know, less grotesque or erotic than it would have been. I mean, there are some books, of course, where, you know, he has his models, you know, sp sp 
uh, splaying their legs open and all that, right, which is, can be considered to be quite rude and shocking. Right? But by and large, I think, you know, because of his uh, um, painterly qualities of his work, okay, many of his works, you know, he, he's seen as you know, one of the greatest painters right, of the latter half of the 20th century. And Jenny Saville, um, she, I mean, you can see her similarity. She's often compared with Freud, okay? But unlike Freud, who also painted male nudes, right? She painted primarily female nudes, okay? And in this work, you can call plan, right? Jenny Saville shows this figure, this female nude from, you know, um, below. So we have to look up to her, all right? You can see that um, her physical bulk, right? Uh, I mean, the, you know, takes up almost the whole canvas, okay? And that's because he also employed the technique of what you call foreshortening, okay? And one peculiar thing about this work, right? Can you see the lines there? The contour lines. And these contour lines are, were actually used to chart the kind of changes in altitude on land masses, you not know, on maps. Okay, it's the kind of, you know, lines you see on maps. Okay, so it's interesting that, you know, she treats the body here as like a kind of a, a land mass, okay? And the, the, the lines are meant to measure and map her body, all right? I suppose, uh, is there any difference between her works and Freud? Okay, I suppose her paint, although there are very excellent painter, painterly qualities in the work, okay, I think her works are maybe less sumptuous than those of Freud's, all right, paint. Okay, Freud uses very thick impasto in his paint. Okay, but I think Seville's work uh, display a kind of a more gritty realism of the human body, all right, compared to Freud's work. All right, a kind of a no holds barred you know, uh, uh, approach right, to the nude. Oh, sorry, I have to, to, to rush. Huh? Um, okay, the male nude, right? Male nude are quite rare, okay? Especially the depiction of male nude as erotic subjects are quite rare okay, in, uh, in the 20th century. Okay, and even fewer women artists have painted the male nude. Right? Okay, let's uh, look at this. Okay, uh, Dana Schutz. Okay, not terribly well known, right, this work. Okay, but Dana Schutz um, here, okay, um, here she imagines herself as the last painter on earth. Right? And the subject as the last subject on earth okay so that that's how she approached this series okay and her subject is uh, 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 named frank okay and frank is someone who has been uh, um, what do you call that marooned on this deserted island right okay and you can see um, the artists you know take great pleasure in trying to manipulate right frank right in this series of works okay so sometimes she would depict him as a kind of a hairy wild man you know on the left Sometimes it's a kind of a sex kitten. I don't know whether you can call it a sex kitten, right? Like a peanut boy on the right. Okay. So I suppose with this work, you know, what Dana Schuh has done, you know, I mean, it's interesting to consider what if a female artist depicts a male nude? Okay. Do we see this with a female gaze? Okay, right? I talked about male gaze earlier. Okay, in fact, the female gaze has not been written about much, you know, in fact, or, or at all. Right? Okay, so she, here she inverts the act of looking. So instead of a male audience looking at a female nude, here we have perhaps you know, a female audience looking at a male nude. Right. Okay, um, David Hockney, okay, and uh, David Hockney is you know, you know, one of the, you know, he's still living today, right? considered to be one of the, the you know, greatest contemporary artists. Right? He's one of the, the pioneers of the pop art movement. Um, he's a British artist, and he went to LA, Los Angeles, in the 1960s. Um, and while he was in Los Angeles, he um, painted a series of uh, he did a series of uh, uh, nude paintings, uh, depicting mainly the male nude. Okay, because Hockney himself was homosexual, right? And um, you know he, he would normally depict the nude either bathing, like this one you have here, or diving into a swimming pool. Okay, the swimming pool, in fact, is quite a common motif, right, in his work during his time in California, right? So what you see here, um, and, you know, uh, Hockney has written a book, 
you know, and, and that book, you know, and you know that he's preoccupied a lot with techniques, okay, and he became fascinated with um, the challenge of how to depict the male nude in action. I, I suppose something like what Degas did right, earlier. Okay, and um, you know, particularly when surrounded by water. Okay, and I think that's what he did here. Right, you can see that here, you know, he has depicted um, you know, the, you know, the, the, the nude, right, taking a shower, right, and how he's trying to, to convey movement as well, right, through um, this particular scene here. Okay, and I suppose here as well, if you can see some of the devices which he adopted, like concealing part of the nude, right, now that's a device that has been adopted by artists like Degas earlier. Okay, so you don't see the nude here in full view, okay, but he's kind of concealed, okay, for example, by, I suppose there's a plant, right, in the foreground, right, okay, so, so David Hockney, one of the, the, the few, okay, um, you know, artists who dare to depict the male nude as a kind of erotic subject in art. Sandra Fisher, now this is, uh, this, he, she's not a terribly well-known artist, right, but if you look at this painting, um, it's part of a, a studies of the male nude, right? Um, you know, there's here she is very a very carefully observed work, very descriptive. Okay, but here you can see how she combines affection with a kind of a gentle uh, sensuality, right? In the way that de she depicts the male nude. So you know, I mean, the way perhaps how um, even female artists depict the male nude is quite different from the way that male artists depict the male nude. Okay, there's a kind of female sensitivity here as well. Okay, there's evident. Okay, um, this is a work by Robert Mapletop. Now, Robert Mapletop is a f essentially a photographer. I think he died when he was in his early 30s. He succumbed to AIDS, right? He succumbed to AIDS. Um, but he's known for his uh, series of photographs. Some are quite controversial, like his series of nudes. In fact, in 1998, um, a poli uh, police in Birmingham okay, raided the home of uh, a university student who had photographs of Mapletop's nudes. Okay? And then they went on to raid the library okay, of the University of Central England, <laughs> right? uh, confiscating the book from which the photographs are taken. Right? So you can see that even in the 90s, right, there was a lot of you know, um, issue regarding censorship. But look at this work. Right. Do you consider this pornographic? I mean, of course, you know, maybe talk his whole series of the S and M, you know, series and all that, the pseudo masochistic images, right? They are a bit more controversial. But this work, right? Is it erotic at all? Is it pornographic? Not at all. If you look at it, it's a piece of a kind of abstract photograph, right? Because it it demonstrates, you know, maple tops, you know, his his um, understanding of form and light, right? Okay, and you can see how, you know, because of that, those qualities, you can look at his works rather as classical and sculptural rather than as pornographic. Right? Okay, last, you don't have this, but uh, I thought, you know, just spend the last three, you know, censoring the nude. Okay, this was one of the earlier controversy where you know, Michelangelo was called back later to paint the Sistine, the, the, the Sistine Chapel, the altar wall. So he painted the altar wall with the Last Judgment, right? Okay, and the Last Judgment again had full of naked figures, right? But this time he created some controversy, right? Because at that time, you know, the, the church was undergo has undergone a split, right? Between the Catholic Church and the Protestants, okay? And, um, you know, when, when this work was first unveiled, right? Uh, you know, church officials came out and attacked it for its obscenity and its immorality. Okay, I mean, one of the Pope's master of ceremonies, right, Cisana, said this: it was disgraceful. Okay, that in so sacred, sacred a place, there should have been depicted all those nude figures, right? And in the Council of Trent, okay, the Council of Trent was a response to the Reformation. Okay, nudity in religious art was condemned. So what happened? After Michelangelo's death, they got another painter to paint drapery over all the nude figures, right? 
And when this painting was restored, underwent a restoration in the early 90s, okay, they got someone else to take away all the draperies. Okay, but they, they managed to take away about half the drapery. Okay? <laughs> and they found out that um, you know, one of the figures that was um, you know, thought to have been male was actually a female. Okay? <laughs> so it tells you how important sometimes restoration is. Okay, and just this a uh, couple of other you know images before we finish. Okay, this is actually in uh, Florida in the U.S. And you can see you know of course this is based on this is Michelangelo's David lah, right, but a smaller version, and you know and and the organizers were told to, you know, again to cover it with uh, a fig leaf lah, you know, but it's a it's a drapery here, right? Okay, so even a society as liberal as um, you know. Uh, the U.S. can sometimes be quite prudish and, and, and uh, conservative. And in Singapore itself, Mr. Choi, you remember this controversy? Oh, you did it. <laughs> it was actually a Mika building. What was uh, Mika is Ministry of Information and Communication, right? Hill Street, right? Mika building where the famous uh, gallery owner Subin, okay, Chua Subin, you know. Um, you know, he had this painting, quite a large size painting, you can see on the right, of a female nude, done by a Chinese painter. Okay, actually he exhibited this outside in the atrium, but I think because of a public complaint, okay, he was told to move this painting into his gallery. All right, and that's a very, you know, I mean, if you look at that nude, right, with a parrot on top, I mean, you know, is that considered pornographic enough to be shifted? Indoors. I don't know about now. This was some time back. Okay, I think I think some some time back. I, I don't know about the attitude now. Whether, you know. But I suppose every time you have a public complaint here, you know, you know, I mean, action is bound to be taken. Okay, but it should, still shows you, I suppose, our attitude towards the new, right? Even in this day, this uh, day and age, right? Okay, thank you very much for your patience and your time. I'm I'm open for questions if you have it. You know, few questions. You know.